introduce the panel. That's in, I think you will probably go into more of an introduction. Yes, a little bit. A little bit. Okay. Yeah. So let me uh, welcome you to the first session, which is of dystopias and utopias, the city as a character. Um, this session uh, is going to be moderated by Ashok Ferry, who I'm sure all of you know, but uh, if you don't, he's a famous author, and uh, he had his show till very recently called the Ashok Ferry Show. Um, and he's moderated several times for me, and he was the first curator of Columboscope. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you back, and you will introduce Kerry and Naresh to the session. Thank you very much indeed, Radhika. First of all, thank you all for coming at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning. I, I, I really appreciate it, and you will get your just rewards later. Um, I have with me an absolute treat for you today. Uh, we have two international authors on my left. This sounds like a boxing match, actually. Um, I have Kerry Young, who has written two books. Uh, one is called Pao, uh, uh, essentially, and the, the other one is called Gloria. They are essentially two halves of the one story, seen through the eyes of two different people, the, the protagonists. Um, and very roughly, I think Pao deals with themes of race and color in Jamaica. Kerry, uh, as you probably know from your program, is a British author of Jamaican Chinese descent. So, so that puts her in a very, very interesting position, especially to people like us who know nothing about Jamaica. So we will hear lots more from her. Um, and Gloria is the second part of, 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 is it going to be a trilogy? Ah, excellent. Second part, uh, which deals with themes of sexuality and gender. Okay. Um, on my right, I have Narish Fernandez from India. Uh, he's the editor of a digital daily called scroll.in, I-N. And he's a consulting editor of the National Geographic. He's from Bombay. Uh, with a very long Indian history. When, when did your family, I mean, you, it goes back three, four hundred years, does it, Naresh, your, your uh, connections with Bombay? Oh, well, it's true, it's true, it's true, but, 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 but with, with Bombay. I, I don't know, Michael. Sorry. You, you. I don't know, I mean, uh, yeah. my, grand, my mother's side of the family have always lived in Bombay, whatever always means. Yeah, yeah, whatever so, always means. But it, it uh, is certainly from the 17th century onwards. Certainly. I don't know. You know, we were looking at uh, the uh, archaeological, uh, anthropological survey of India, yeah. and there were sort of uh, hominoids running around my part of Bombay. So, oh dear, so, so. Presumably a for direct a few million descendant, years. A direct descendant. <laughs> and, and, and this is Naresh's book, uh, A City Adrift. He, do, he does have another one called Taj Mahal Foxtrot, which is enormously interesting. If we get time, we'll deal with that. Uh, he just told me it's a big tome, and he hasn't brought it down here. But there are two books, City Adrift, and, and Taj Mahal Foxtrot, and Kerry's books are Pao and Gloria. So do please look out for them. In, in the fullness of time when they arrive on these show, shores, I'm sure they'll get to barefoot sooner or later and reach the APA. Okay, um, since but I'm pretty sure none of you have read their works. I thought it would be very good to start with a short reading from each of them of five minutes, five minutes no more. Kerry, would you like to, to kick off? I'm just going to read to you from the beginning because um, that seems a sensible thing to do. This is Kingston, Jamaica, 1945. Me and the boys were sitting in the shop talking about how good business was and how we need to go hire up some help. And that is when she show up. She just appeared in the doorway like she come out of nowhere. She was standing there with the sun shining and her showing off this hat. Well, it was more like a kind of turban like the Indians wear. Only it looked 10 times better than that. Or maybe it just looked 10 times better than her. She got on this blue dress. Looked like they must have saw it up with her already inside of it. It's so tight. And a pair of high heel shoes I never before seen the like of. I almost feel embarrassed that she come and find me here like this. Sitting on the empty orange crate in my vest and a bear battle in my hand. So we all three of us quickly jump up and we said to her, how can we help? And what she want is for me to go visit her sister in the hospital. 
so I can see what some white sailor boy do to her. What he do to her, Hampton asked. He beat her. He beat her so bad I can hardly recognize her, my own sister. So what he beat her for? Just go see her, that is all I'm asking of you. And then she turned directly to me and she said, can you do that? And I just say yes, even though I don't know why. And then she said, thank you, and hand me a piece of paper with the details of the hospital where the sister at. The sister named Marcia Campbell. And then she said, Marcia will tell you how you can contact me if you decide you want to help. And she turned and she walked outside of the shop. No sooner than she gone, Hampton started the sister a whore man. How you know that? Sure man, sure, what do you think she do with the sailor boy? The most likely arguing over money. And this one, she probably a whore as well. Even though she looks so good and I bet she tastes fine. But she's a whore man, sure. So what you say? You say if she a whore, it don't matter if she get beat. It come with the territory. Like should I get vexed if somebody try my patience? No man, it come with the territory. I said to Judge Finley, you think she just a whore as well? Yes, he said. I think most likely Hampton right. But if this white boy beat her, the way the sister said, then you have to ask yourself what kind of man this is. And if it's okay for a white man to beat a Jamaican woman and it just pass like that. Come on, white men been beating Jamaican women for 300 years. That is true, I said to Hampton. But this is the first time anybody come ask us to go do something about it. Ladies and gentlemen, Kerry Young. Thank you very much, Kerry. Uh, next up, we have Narish uh, reading from City Adrift. Actually, I have to oh. read from the jazz book. Uh, OK, excellent. excellent. Sorry, I can't do patois. So it's just going to have to be regular Bombay <laughs> speak. <laughs> this is from a chapter called Forgetting the Ganges. One evening in 1935, shortly after he had accepted an invitation to dine at the Taj Mahal Hotel in downtown Bombay, 24-year-old Dosu Karaka realized that he had a problem. The Parsi student was on a long holiday home from Oxford, but he'd exhausted his supply of dress shirts on the voyage out. Still, he wasn't going to let the limitations of his wardrobe keep him away from his engagement. After all, it wasn't every day that Bombay got to dance to a Negro orchestra. As his appointment approached, Karaka slipped on a short-sleeved sports shirt and stuck on a black dress bow, hoping that Bombay's smart set would be fooled into thinking he was dressed in the latest London fashion. Stepping into the pale green air-conditioned confines of the Taj ballroom, he was hit by a wave of sound. On stage, a dapper violinist from Minnesota named Leon Abbey and his seven-piece band, fresh from their triumphs in the continent, were expertly varying the mood. Now soft, slow, languid. Now hard, grating syncopation. The floor was filled with dancers. One suave couple immediately caught Karaka's eye. She is beautiful, so believing. He is strong, manly. They look into each other's eyes, so warm, so romantic. But elegance wasn't mandatory on the dance floor that evening, for Karaka also witnessed the following scene. A mountain of jelly bounces up and down, encircling in his arms 200 pounds of femininity he calls his wife. They too were once in love. That was long ago. Now the eyes have lost their, their spark. Cheeks have sagged. All around Karaka, the tables were filled with women in patu and molinu and knockoffs by local tailors. There were long skirts, short skirts, and tight skirts. But the profusion of well attired womanhood didn't hold Karaka's attention for long. After all, he was there for the music, and the swinging sounds had him transfixed. There he stands, Leon Abbey in the flesh. Leon Abbey from the ambassador in Paris, Karaka marveled. At the piano, Dizzy fiddles with the keys. Dizzy of Cher Florence. Nothing worries him. Legs crossed, now left, now right. He tinkles away. The saxophone bellows, and from the muted trumpet comes the blues. He was transported. And that, rather than the young man's fashion ensemble, proved to be his undoing. The music went to my head that evening, and when Leon started beating up a rumba, 
I left my partner and my table to shake the maracas that were offered to me, Karaka wrote in, memoir, in his memoir a few years later. In those few moments, I forgot my whole upbringing, forgot that I was back in my father's through which the Ganges flows, and that the Sen was far, far away. By the time Karaka awoke the next morning, his father, a high-ranking customs official, had already received several phone calls about his son's unseemly behavior. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naresh. Um, both excellent, excellently read. Uh, now, this festival is about, I mean, we, com we constitute the literary part of the festival, but at the same time, this festival is about cities. I just wanted to ask each of you, who decides what a city is? Now, who, who invented the term that Paris is a city of lights, or Venice is la serenissima, or Ro that Rome is eternal? And if you had to characterize your city, Kingston, how, how would you do it? Or is this, is this a complete misnomer? Is this some advertising gimmick that people come up with? I have no, I, I have no idea. I, I, I was trying to, I was thinking yesterday about it. Kingston, and I didn't know how it finished. Kingston is a city of what? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. And, and I think the things that people might come up with are not so flattering. You know, it's not, it's not, city is a, Kingston is a city of Ganja. I'm not sure that we'd want to, we'd want well, to. Well, it might encourage lots of people to go there. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm, music? I'm not, I'm, well, yeah, there's, there's, the, there's Ganja, there's, uh, what is it, Bob Marley. Uh, one of the interesting things I, I've noticed since I've been here in Sri Lanka is how many tuk-tuks have, like, pictures of Bob Marley, and I, I had Absolutely. no idea. You know, Bob Marley, King of Reggae, Bob Marley, all sorts of things. So maybe Kingston is the city of Bob Marley. Kingston is a city of reggae, I think. Certainly it is that. Excellent, excellent. Narish, you have a much more difficult time because Bombay is actually the size of a country, quite a large country. I mean, it is 12 million people, which is half the size of Sri Lanka. Can it be characterized? Can, can you come up with anything, a catchy slogan? You know, and there are catchy slogans that come up all the time uh, because we are the center of the Hindi film industry. Every now and then, a catchy song title, for instance, will come to people believe uh, have captured the spirit of the city. There's often quite a difference between the way insiders see a city and the way people from outside see a city. So for instance, my friend Suketu Mehta wrote a book called Maximum City that somehow people have taken to uh, without actually reading the damn book. Uh, because Bombay, in addition to be this glam city of glass facades and fancy restaurants, is a city in which 50% of people live in slum. And a great deal of Saketu's book is actually about the slum, but people sort of seem to forget that bit. And they take away the bar dancers and the gangsters and sort of a, a notion of Chicago in the 1930s transported to the, the subcontinent of the 1990s. Uh, which, which also is quite accurate with your, with your book on jazz and art deco in Bombay and so on. So it obviously did have that as well. Sort of, when, right, when thinking about cities, I like to think about what Jimmy Breslin, the American reporter, said. And he would do the show in which uh, he would uh, look at the camera and say, New York, a city of 9 million people, 9 million stories. And oh, 8 million people and 8 million stories. And I think that's what cities are. We're a combination of individual narratives that sort of emerge uh, and, and converge into some sort of mythology. Kerry, in, in, in your books, um, there are lots of areas which, which mean nothing to me. And I would like you to explain there's the, what is the significance of East Kingston and West Kingston, Trenchtown, which we've all heard about from Bob Marley's song, uh, Franklin Town, Passmore Town. Would you like to tell us a little bit about those? Well, I, I think Kingston, like, like any city, is divided into, into different uh, sections, if you like. And, and in, in Kingston, like I guess in any other city, those sections are to do with relative wealth. Is, is the east uh, poorer? Is it rougher? Is that oh, no, the west is. So, so what happened, this is what happened. Um, when slavery was abolished, in 1838, a lot of the uh, plantation slaves left the plantation because they could. And they went, they went into the hills deciding that they would farm in the hills. And whilst they were away, the British plantation owners needed people to work the plantation. So they, they had ships coming from China and India. So they imported indentured laborers from China 
and India. When the African heritage slaves, ex-slaves, realized that they couldn't farm in a cockpit country because you can't grow anything up there, um, they came back to Kingston, came back to uh, the city and found that, came back to the plantations and found that their jobs had been taken by the Chinese and the, and the Indian laborers that had been imported. So they went to the city, which I think lots of, lots of times you will see that poor people leave the country and they head for the city, and the this, this city was Kingston. So they headed for the city, and when they got to the city, they found there were no jobs there. And they settled in what became West Kingston. And so you, 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 you get the, the, uh, the townships of West Kingston, Trenchtown, Denham Town, Jonestown, those very, very poor areas. And so in later years, when we have all the troubles that we have in Kingston later in the 70s, it, it, that's notoriously, that's where the trouble is because that's where the worst of the poverty is in, in West Kingston. So the famous Tivoli Gardens, I mean, really, really quite recently, we had the, we had the issues with the authorities trying to um, uh, extradite coke Judas Coke, Judas Coke back to the States. And of course, his stronghold is Tivoli Gardens, which is in West Kingston, which is the old, the old area of what was originally called Backyard, <laughs> which appears in, in Gloria Backyard. And it was bulldozed and, and Tivoli Gardens made. So West Kingston is really the poor area. So East Kingston is kind of uh, lower middle class in those days because, I mean, those books are the timeline. Uh, are going back to the 30s and 40s. And then, of course, the wife, Faye, lives uptown. And, yeah, and uptown so. is, is, you know, uptown girl is, is as it sounds. Chinatown's, Chinatown is, is downtown on the waterfront between East and West Kingston. It's sort of just below what, you know, central. So Chinatown still exists? It's, it's very much uh, there? Yeah, Chinatown still exists. And Chinatown is still there. All the stores are there. The restaurants are there. The names of all... The, the Chinese proprietors of those places. But many of the Chinese have left. Many of the middle class Chinese who in 1972 when Michael Manley came to power weren't very happy about his views about redistributing wealth. So a lot of the poor Chinese who couldn't afford to leave stayed. And a lot of the ver very rich Chinese who weren't going to leave uh, stayed. And a lot of the, the lower and you know, middle class Chinese left and went to Canada and the States predominantly. But Chinatown itself, the, f the physicality of Chinatown is still there. Although the occupants of Chinatown are now more African heritage. Uh, the, 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 the book, Pao, is Pao's the godfather of Chinatown. The, the, the current godfather of Chinatown is not Chinese. Yeah, and we'll deal with that uh, a bit later on. Um, so, so you have sort of migration of poorer people coming in and cities becoming larger. And Narish, you, you have this particularly in Bombay where you have the very rich living cheek by jowl with the very poor and, and Bombay has the extremes on either side. And you talk about this business, this kind of development where cities turn in on themselves. So the rich build high walls. It happened in Colombo, I remember 20 years ago, because our walls were just four foot and suddenly everybody started raising their walls. And, and in Bombay you have gated communities and so on. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? This is very unnerving for us because it's a, it's a process that's essentially happened over the last 15 years. Uh, Bombay's most iconic structure, uh, if you know it, and it's a, it appears in a lot of the tourist brochures, is the Gateway of India. It's a symbol of openness on the waterfront that essentially says, come in, we welcome everybody. And now this uh, city that had adopted this portal is becoming a city of walls. It's closing its gates. Uh, this is almost an inversion of this history of openness. Uh, it's uh, a refusal to acknowledge that it was a city built on the enterprise and the labor of generations of migrants. Uh, and this is happening in an architectural, spatial sort of way, where it's uh, Bombay's a peninsula. There's not very much room to expand. And so the rich are attempting to carve out enclaves in which they don't have to deal with the poor people, uh, even visually. So there are all of these architectural feints and slights that sort of keep you from looking at, uh, at the poverty around you. Uh, a few years ago, the Four Seasons Hotel came up in Bombay, uh, essentially in a, a neighborhood that had uh, graveyards on one side and a sewage canal to the front. 
Uh, and so this is about a 14 or 15 story building. For the first nine stories, you can't actually look out. Uh, there are all sorts of reflective glasses that mean that you can only see your own mug. Uh, and then they have a terrace bar, sort of on the 15th or 16th floor. And when you look out from there, the city is aestheticized. You see uh, the sewage canal, but it looks like Venice or something. And you sure as hell can't smell it. Uh, and so this means um, this sort of has all sorts of implications. Uh, in terms of planning, it means that we now privilege the private vehicle and the infrastructure that facilitates the movements of cars over the public transport over system, public transport, which yeah. was once Bombay's great pride and joy. So uh, you know, every day about 80% of Bombay's people get into this damn train. There are six million people who, who take who take the, the 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 two lines, and then others take the bus. Six million people is more than the population of, of New Zealand and I think Australia. Maybe the population of Australia and New Zealand combined getting into the so train. So everybody, every Australian taking the same train, and, in other words. And, it's, and when you get into the train, uh, you negotiate in some unspoken way with complete strangers. Now, when you get into your car, you don't have to deal with anybody else. And I think this lack of, of traveling together, being in the same spaces, has just resulted in uh, walls in people's minds, uh, that you shut other people out. And it means that we have these few exclusive spaces that are like Australia, and then we have the rest of the city, the rest of us in, which is yeah. becoming like sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, is it is it the same in uh, in in Kingston? I, th I I think I think it's the same in um, all cities. I I actually don't think Kingston or Bombay or I don't think they're any different. What, what happens is that you get a, a an overcrowding of a number of people, and those people have relative wealth, and the ones who have more try to insulate themselves against the ones who uh, have less. But and is they it a, do that in different, different ways. But is it a necessary evil? I mean, is there some way that you can regulate this so that, to stop the rich turning in on themselves? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I, if there is, I think it'd be interesting. We to, haven't discovered yeah, it yet. I think if, if there is, it'd be interesting to find out. I, I think people who, who um, have enough money to build their walls, and we, we, we have some very expensive, expensive walls, or, you know, they, they, don't even, they don't even live there. I mean, because if, if you actually think about a place like, like Jamaica, a lot of the rich people, a lot of the people who own the land don't even live there. So it's not even a case of, of what, it, it, you take something like Cambridge University. Cambridge University still owns loads of land in Jamaica. Because the because the landowners um, who own the plantations Plantation, yeah. left mm. went to Cambridge University and left when they died they left the land to the University of Cambridge so the University of Cambridge in England owns loads of land in, and that's true of um, of a lot of the land that's actually owned by overseas. Yeah, or um, they live in Switzerland or they live in whatever. So the, you it, it's kind of a false thing to say that the rich insulate themselves by building walls, etc. So that's true. But the really rich aren't even there. Yeah. Well, actually, we have exactly this here in Colombo, I digress, but many of our blocks of apartments, you go drive at night, and just one or two windows have lights, because most of those owners are expatriate Sri Lankans living abroad. But it's not only the physical exclusion, is it? Uh, um, uh, we were talking the other day about how certain areas on Malabar Hill, you cannot actually buy an apartment if you're not vegetarian. Would you like to tell us that funny story about the, the restaurant? So Bombay is always, um, people have always, uh, of, of the same community, have always congregated together. And in the 1930s, this was thought to be a perfectly acceptable way of arranging society. So the big Bombay, or the big Indian cricket tournament was called the Pentangular, which was played between the Hindus, the Muslims, the, uh, the others. Uh, and so it was, it was five uh, groups of people. And this also translated, the social arrangement translated itself into a physical arrangement of the city. Uh, people of, uh, of, of specific communities were allowed to build uh, housing blocks in which they all congregated, and nobody else 
legally could live there. So Bombay has a Parsi colony. Uh, I live in what is a Catholic colony. There are Hindu colonies also. So, so what is the legal thing? It's, I mean, you it's legal. Really? And uh, you would imagine that with independence, these laws would have uh, been struck down. But they continue. Uh, I think there's some weird human impulse for people to gather together, and then this makes them insular. Uh, but now, there are new uh, groups that are coming up. And so the vegetarians uh, on Malabar Hill, the, the, one of the most exclusive parts of Bombay, uh, many of these people are diamond traders. They're all from one village called Palanpur. And they control the world's diamond trade uh, along with the Jews in Antwerp. And there's sort of a, a little tussle happening now in Antwerp between the Palanpuri Jains and the Hasidic Jews who control the diamond trade. Uh, in Bombay, uh, they are strict vegetarians. They're from a community called the Jains. I'm not sure whether there's any yeah, we, we, community. But, uh, we and, don't have a community, but we know of them. And yeah. they have very strict dietary rules. They can't. Uh, eat anything that grows under the ground, no garlic, for instance, because these excite the passions. Uh, and they do. <laughs> I know, you sound like a garlic eater. I am, very much. <laughs> and they don't eat, uh, they don't allow eggs, but that's many Indians. Uh, and uh, somebody tried to open a pizza place a few years ago in uh, this area. And uh, they began to attack them, because vegetarianism is supposed to be the impulse uh, not to harm any living creatures, except other human beings who are not like you. <laughs> so they would hurl nails from uh, their terraces, and they would spit at patrons, and they drove these guys out of town. But um, in addition to the physical violence, they have transformed that neighborhood, because they boycott any store now within a large radius that serves non-vegetarian food, or the restaurants there realize that these very rich people won't come in if you have meat on your menus. So every restaurant in that strip now serves only vegetarian food. So it's a sort of apartheid, really. I mean, where where sort of, but a willing one, or sort yeah, of unseen. Yeah, I mean, everybody falls in line. Yeah. Uh, because there's a lot of money to be made from falling yeah. in line. But but it's very interesting that you said that this ghettoization, which we think is quite a modern phenomenon, isn't that it was always there. Right, um, and I think as she writes about uh, Jamaica and Kingston, people have always clustered together. I was fascinated when I lived in New York. I was telling you yesterday about how Sri Lankans are all uh, gathered in Staten Island. But these are reinventions of the homeland often. So people, when they get off the boat, want to be with people like them. But in the Sri Lankan case, it's both Sinhalese and Tamils who live in the same place. Uh, they were fleeing the violence at home and decided and then, in Staten Island they had more in common they, than they could have at home. And they end up together, <laughs> yes. It's and a sort in of, little yeah. Indias around the world, it's people from North India and South India and Bengal uh, who would not have anything to do with each other at home, who throw nails at each other on Malabar Hill, who will happily live together in Jackson Heights. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, in fact, um, in, in, there's a line in one of your books where you, you talk about um, uh, the, the Gloria's daughter, who is black, and she says, it's, it's a lovely line, I, I wish I could remember it, where you know, she wants her to grow up uh, and have a good education because still be, being black is, is a black mark in every sense of the word. Is it still like that, do you feel? No, it's not like that. I mean, the, the thing about these books is that you have to remember the time. Yes, the it, it time expands span. from so the 30s. So 1938, so the time span is actually 1938. Uh, through to the, the end of the second Michael Manley administration in the 1980s. So at the point at which Gloria's talking about uh, the future of her daughter, we, 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 this is kind of like the 50s. So that, that was a very long time ago. And kind of listening to, listening to uh, Naresh and, th and I'm thinking about Kingston, and I realized that, that Kingston's not like that. Kingston, Kingston has a Chinatown. But it's, it's not so much Chinatown because everyone's living there. It's because it's where business is conducted. So a lot of the Chinese who have stores or grow, uh, laundries, whatever it is, don't necessarily live in Chinatown. Okay. And I, I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm picturing Kingston and I, I'm seeing that different people live in different places according to wealth. But it isn't, there isn't like a vegetarian part or a, or a Catholic part or a Hindu part. That, you know, we were very proud in Jamaica that the national uh, motto is out of many, one people. 
because we're all imports. So once the, the Spanish and the, and the British got through murdering all the original, uh, the Arawaks, everybody else is an import. The Africans, slaves from India, the Chinese, the Irish, the, the, Jews, the Jews in Jamaica. We have a lot of uh, poor Germans who came, uh, you know, in the 1800s. We have a lot of Irish, Scottish overseers, white overseers who came, who were also very poor. I mean, they got chucked off the plantation as well. Um, so we have a, a, a very um, rich mix of, of people in Jamaica. And it, we, I don't, you know, and I, I think it's a long time since I actually lived there. But I, I don't, when I go home, I don't experience this kind of enclave living. So it, within the enclave, because you can afford to live in the gated community, it would be Africans, it would be Indians, it would be Chinese. And they're all living together happily in that enclave because they have the money to do that. But is there, is there as happens in many countries in Asia, is there a kind of move towards um, authenticity, as they call it, you know, where, say, the blacks feel that this is our country and anyone else? I mean, is there, you know, we have this here with, with the, sort of the, the move towards fundamentalism in, in all kind of religions and, and whatever. Is there any move by one particular racial group to kind of sort of edge the others out? I, I think we sort of had that. We had that sort of move back in a while. It was all back to Africa and the Rastafarian and all, uh, all of that, you know, Babylon must fall. Have you got over that now? Is it, I, is I think we've gotten over that. And I think what, what has helped us to get over that is the, the, the much freer movement educationally, socially, in terms of employment and, and so on. The much freer movement of different, different peoples so we have, we, so we have um, you know, uh, 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 an African heritage prime minister. Um, we, so, you know, previously the prime ministers might be lighter skinned until, until uh, PJ Patterson. The, the, the Manleys were lighter skinned and, and even Bustamante was, relatively speaking, quite light skinned. Right. So by the time we get to PJ Patterson, it was a little while ago, you know, PJ Patterson's very dark. And so you, you have, if you look at photographs of the current cabinet, there's Indians, there's all, there's all shades. And I think that movement of education and wealth and, and opportunity has, has changed that. You know, in Jamaica they say, this is what they, they say, you can't tell a Jamaican by looking at them. Because so, we got white Jamaican and black Jamaican and we got Chinese and Jew and Scottish and, and Welsh and everything. The only way you can tell a Jamaican is when to open them out. <laughs> but, uh, but it's extraordinary what you're saying, because actually, uh, you, you, what makes you guys so special and so different from us Asians, where, where we are quite divisive, aren't we? Whether we like it or not. I mean, uh, is it because Jamaicans are really laid back and very, very inclusive, or is it that we're just bad? Well, I think uh, even the Caribbean is actually much more contested than Jamaica. So in places where there's a sort of 50% Indian heritage and 50% African heritage, uh, the, the conflicts are much more pronounced. So uh, Guyana and Trinidad uh, sort of have been at a state of racial warfare now for quite long and there are periods of equilibrium, uh, but uh, it, it often is quite intense. Uh, which may just prove that South Asians, wherever we go around the world, we uh, keep we fighting. We cause trouble. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's talk about the language in these two books, because that, that I, I, it seems to me that language is, is a great unifier. Um, now, uh, uh, Naresh, you talk in, in your book about Salman Rushdie, who calls the, the language of Bombay Hugmi. Mm -hmm. um, what is that? It com it's comprised of lots of different words, borrowed so, words, is it? Uh, so in, Bom in Bombay, and there's at least one person from Bombay here, uh, uh, we uh, speak what we call Bambaya, which is a great uh, mishmash of Hindi, Urdu, Gujarati, Marathi, and English, which Salman Rushdie calls Hagmi. It's an acronym that says Hagmi. Uh, but you know, India has always had these sort of uh, languages that unify. Hindustani is in itself uh, a language that uh, is, is a uh, uh, combination is an, uh, language, and, is it? Yeah. And Urdu in itself, which is now thought of as a classical language, the word Urdu derives from the word horde. And uh, it was the language that the camp followers of the Mughals, who uh, people the Spoke bazaars, Persian or whatever. Uh, and they, uh, no, so they didn't speak Persian. Okay, that, that was it. Yeah. Urdu was the language that they cobbled together 
these people who spoke Persian and Hindustani and all of these other languages as a way to communicate. So Urdu, which has now achieved the status of the language of poetry, was in itself a sort of bastard language. Yeah, in its day, yeah. And, and of course, uh, uh, Kerry, in your books, one of the really beautiful things about your books is the, is the language. And when you spoke, that same magic kind of came across. It, it's wonderful, because it's something that I, I, I think we have tried, many authors have tried, but unsuccessfully, to achieve a sort of a, 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 a Sri Lankan tone to the English language. Um, and what is also really refreshing is that even if I read it and I don't particularly understand Jamaican Patwa, when I read it, it is very clear. Um, how did that come about? I mean, has it always, has the Patwa always been there? Is it always changing? Is it ever changing? Or is it kind of fixed now? I, I think it's, language is always changing and the Patwa is changing, but it, it's kind of fixed now. I, I, it was a language invented by a nation of people who needed to communicate with each other. When you think that all the slaves came from different regions of Africa and they, they, didn't, they weren't able to communicate. And then you have the Chinese who came from different parts of China and they, the, all the different dialects, the Indians and, and all these different people. So we had a need to invent um, a way of communicating with each other. We, we needed to, to unify in that sense. And we had the history of the Spanish and then 300 years of British rule. So we had to invent something based on those languages uh, that, we, that we'd be able to communicate with each other. And so the basis of it is English. And in, in school, you would, you would speak standard English. You'd be expected. So one of the things about the books, and you mentioned this yesterday, is that Pao, Pao's a Chinese immigrant as a child to Jamaica. And he kind of picks up the lingo. now. Gloria is uh, African Heritage, the second book, African Heritage. And in, in Gloria, the, the, the patois is stronger. Much stronger, yeah. isn't it? I mean, she so, uses that word, kian, C-Y-A-N. Kian, so why are we going to do that? But so in, in the next book, which is the third hand, if you like, so in Pau, Pau has um, uh, an African Heritage mistress his whole life, and that's Gloria, that's Gloria's book. And he has a Chinese wife, which is the third book, which comes out next summer. Because uh, Faye's been very well educated in her, um, in her convent school. And so on the page, she speaks perfect English. But of course, uh, on the page is different. You know, if someone speaks English with an Indian accent or a Canadian or a New Zealand, Australian, you can tell. So it was quite difficult to put Faye authentically on the page in proper English, but at the same, same time still give her a nice middle-class Jamaican accent. Uh, of course, I mean, we do this here in Sri Lanka. We tend to switch accents depending on who we speak to. I mean, Narish, do you have, um, is there a particular Goanese accent or Bombay accent or something that you can identify when you speak English? Is there, or is it fairly proper? I think you can uh, tell from the, way, from the people's vocabulary, often there's a cadence to how they speak. It would depend on uh, what language you speak at home and whether English is your first language or your second language. Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. It's, it's a difficult thing. But to can, can you identify people, or sort of what, what uh, community they come from, from the accent? Or is that not I possible? I think school has been a great leveler. And in our generation, it's almost impossible to tell. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to talk about the history of these towns because actually, I mean, uh, Kingston, 16, is it 1692 or it's a, certainly 17th century, isn't it? I mean, the British came to, w when did they come to, to, to Kingston? 1655, sorry. Um, so you do have these layers. You have half a millennium almost of, of kind of, you know, layers of history. And, and of course, with Bombay, it's, 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 it's enormously long. I mean, the layers. Uh, what do you do when you have a, a, a sort of, a, I don't know, Syriac Christian overlaid by Mughal, overlaid by um, uh, yeah, sort of very different things. And then everybody claims that. I, I think it happens in your book where perhaps the Hindus move in and say, well, there was a temple here. Get rid of the mosque or whatever. I mean, how, how do you sort out who owns that? Which layer wins? Mm. Well, in, in Bombay, it's, a, it's a, always a contestation. Is it the money that wins? <laughs> uh, it's money and it's numbers. It's political power. And so we have the Shiv Sena, which is a sort of nativist party, which says that they are the sons of the soil, 
But of course, my ancestors uh, will claim that we are the sons of the soil. There are many more of them, uh, and so nobody listens to us. Uh, but uh, in Bombay, it's been uh, the Shiv Sena has constantly shifted its targets. First, it began by um, targeting South Indians uh, because they wanted, South Indians had a lot of the clerical jobs that the Shiv Sena wanted. Later, they decided it was going to be Muslims because all through India, uh, it was politically uh, expedient to attack Muslims. Now, they're attacking migrants from North India. Uh, and so the enemy is never the same person. Those are all very useful lessons for us because, you know, whatever happens in Bombay happens to us 20 years later. So we can, hopefully we can learn from your mistakes, but I doubt we will. Well, Bombay uh, still hasn't quite settled into a state of equilibrium, so yeah. uh, I hope it doesn't follow you here. Yeah. Uh, what, what about Kingston? Do you have layers of, I mean, you know, uh, do people like colonial architecture? Do they preserve it or do they think it's, uh, it's somehow shameful in some way and, and needs to be got rid of? I don't, I don't think it's that. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm speaking about things that I don't really know about by the time we get to this point. I don't think it's that. I, I think it's about, I keep coming back to money, and I think it's about investment. When, you, when you're a country that, uh, first of all, is a country that's a country of, of people who've been all brought there by the British, and organized, and you talk about the layers, organized in layers according to how the British wanted it. So they, you know, we organized the ex-slaves at the bottom, and then because we didn't, you know, we, we were up here, the white plantation owners, we got the ex-slaves down here. We need a middle class, so we'll go and get ourselves some Chinese, and we'll ma make them the middle class, and then we need some kind of lower middle class, we go get ourselves some Indians, and we'll, we'll do that. So you have a society that's been created, stratified, by the British to suit their own, their own needs. And you also have a society where all the profit has left the island, whether that profit was the, from the sugar cane that left the island, or later on when it was the bauxite that left the island. So all, all the profits. So in a sense, you have no capital. And what you now have to do is you have to somehow try to attract capital. That capital now comes to you in the form of investment. It comes to you in the form of investment, particularly f to build hotels and so on. So because you don't have the capital, you have to let the investors decide. Um, okay, play by their rules. You play by their rules. So if they want to, uh, if they want to take an old plantation house and turn it into a fantastic hotel, that's what they do. But if they don't want to do that, if they just want to take the, the strip of beach and build new high-rise hotels on, that's what they do. <laughs> yeah, if they want to go up into the mountains and, and, and whatever, they do that. Because you're, you're relying on the investment and the capital that's been brought on the island. The profit's still being taken off the island. But in the meantime, what you have is a lot of jobs for people working in the, in the tourist industry. Um, and, you, and you have training and you attract, you're attracting foreign currency off the island in the form of the tourists. But, you know, as these things go, a lot of that currency is actually being harvested abroad because people are paying in Canada for the all-inclusive. So very few of those American and Canadian dollars are actually landing on the island, only except what we can, we can tempt the tourists into buying from the traders who now have to come into the hotel because the local economy has been destroyed by the all-inclusive. And you have a hotel like that in your book, of course, where, where nothing leaves. You just don't allow your visitors to leave. Um, Narish, um, you, you spoke about this earlier. 48.5% of Bombay, that is roughly 6 million people, are slum dwellers. Mm. I mean, can big cities work? Can, I mean, you know, you get more and more people coming in. It seems to me that the problems just get larger. You're not making it any more successful. Do you think it works? Um, do you think, can Bombay work? I mean, it does work, doesn't it? Or it does, does it? It does work, and it could work much better if we thought about uh, mechanisms to enfold people into cities. And in uh, 19th and early 20th century Bombay, they created vast pools of low-cost housing for workers. They're now called chawls. Uh, Bombay in the, uh, since the late 20th century doesn't do this anymore. Uh, the uh, logic of the market is that everybody finds their own way. Um, this doesn't work. As the number of poor people or people inadequately housed in Bombay has increased in this period. The richest people, not just in India, but in the world, now live in Bombay. So Bombay 
uh, has the most expensive uh, single family house in the world, which is owned by a guy called Ambani. It's a house that's 23 stories high uh, for his four member family. There are seven, uh, I think the first four or five layers are for parking, which means that uh, every family has a whole layer of parking to themselves. Uh, paradoxically, uh, in the age in which we certify everything, this is also certified to be one of the most environmentally friendly buildings in Bombay, which makes no sense. But Ambani, the Ambani family now, looks out from its tower onto this vast sea of slums. And you wonder what's going through these people's minds, that they think they've sequestered themselves, uh, but they actually haven't. Uh, they have to breathe the same air as the rest of us, and they're all going to get dengue, because those mosquitoes can also fly into their house. Are you sure it's not preserved? There's probably <laughs> some, some system that, that gives them clearer air than us. Uh, uh, all the yeah. air purifiers. But, but I, uh, this is actually very useful to us because, because there is a big talk here of a mega police and make Colombo huge or mm. mega. But, but you know, hopefully we can learn from Bombay's experience or perhaps we won't learn. We'll, we'll just copy you and then end up even worse than and you. And Bombay's you actually know? the worst example in the world yeah. to copy from. Uh, yeah. ar around the other parts of the world, they're talking about uh, what, what they call densification. And that, as in, especially in cities like Vancouver, they can't deal with this sprawl in uh, places like Detroit. They're actually breaking down sections of the city because it costs so much money to deliver electricity and water all the way to the end of the line. And they're trying to get people to cluster around a core again. Uh, so even in, as the West, they're sort of doing different things because they realize cities are unsustainable. Uh, we are now copying a model of cities, Western cities, in the 60s, city models that have been discredited in the places that they originated. Look, we're running out of time, so uh, perhaps I... Uh, yes, we'll go, to, we'll, go, we'll, we'll go to questions first, and then if we have time, we'll have some readings. Uh, there's a lady here who wants to ask a question. Can we get a mic across to her, please? Uh, well, the people behind you won't hear. Uh, the, 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 it, this is supposed to be dystopias and utopias. And I didn't hear the word dystopia or utopia used. Thankfully, thankfully, because us writers, we don't use large words. No, but this is the, the heading mm. for this seminar. Yes. And are there any utopias in this world today? Was there ever a utopia? And is everything dystopia? I'd like to ask you all. Good question. Who would like to take this one? Kerry? I, I, I don't think there are any Utopia. utopias. Yes. I'm not, I, but I also I don't think that it's all dystopia. I mean, I don't think it's all one thing or the other. I, th I think what I see is that it's many things. It's many layered and it has many dimensions. And I think one of the things, one of the interesting things I think about life, and it's not just about cities, and I think it's reflected in the books, is that life is, life is many layered and people are many layered, so there, there's no real proper villains in the book. Even the people who do awful things are always somehow redeemable. And I think that's, about, that's true of cities, it's true of life, that we, we do the best we can. There's a quote at the beginning of Power, it's from Karl Marx, and it says, we don't create our own circumstances. It says, we live in circumstances not created by ourselves, but given to us, passed to us from history. Yeah, and, and I say, and we try to do our best. And I think in every city, and I, I think about Kingston, I've been sitting here thinking a lot about Kingston, I think we've tried to do our best. And maybe, maybe where we are now is because we've come through some very difficult, we've had some very difficult moments um, in Kingston, in Jamaica over the years, and we've come through that now. And uh, I think that uh, where we are right now is where we are trying to do our best. And it, it is the, it's the Kingston of, um, King, what did I say? The Kingston of, uh, of reggae or the Kingston. But I think it right is. Right at the start. Uh, right, the right, going back to the beginning. I think it is the Kingston of. I wanted to say contentment, but I don't think it is contentment. But I think we have reached a place where. An which is more peaceful. Yeah, it's a more peaceful. It's a more peaceful Kingston now. I think that it's been for a very long time. Gosh, And that's not you. utopia. But I think we only get there because of the difficult path we've had on our way. I don't know if I don't know if you always have to have such a difficult path, but 
Well, I've just been told it's zero minutes. Is it a quick question? Very yeah. quick. I just wanted to ask the uh, panel about uh, uh, globalization. Uh, London is owned by the Russian oligarchs. Uh, you heard Bombay being owned by all sorts of foreign investors. So we hear from Kingston. Now, if you depend on the market to uh, provide uh, uh, enhancement, you have to live by the market. You cannot try and socially engineer the market. So the arguments that you are putting forward is that the market has created wealthy capitals in the world. And at the same time, this market has created a large section, uh, section or sediments of poverty around it. So if you were, we elect governments to intervene in the market. If the government intervenes to socially engineer a market, we all scream, jump up and down, saying money should flow its own way, and money, money, money uh, will at the end determine. I, I, its I'm going to have destiny. to ask you to stop right there, but I want each of the authors to give us our final word on that. Naresh? But you are working on the assumption that the market is some sort of force of nature, like gravity. Markets are social constructs, and the rules of the market are determined uh, by human beings. And uh, the sort of market you're talking about has been determined by a certain sort of speculative capital who wants you to believe that this is the only way markets can operate. Um, but so, uh, societies are not markets, and around the world, Societies make a decision about what they want their countries to be. Canada is a good example of how uh, it has uh, some controls. It has a national health system, for instance. And all around the world, cities uh, provide large amounts of public housing, public transport. These do not necessarily answer to the whims of capital. Uh, and so, yes, you do determine what you want and what you don't want. You make a decision about what you think a society should invest in and what uh, a private capital can be allowed to invest in. Kerry, the final word. Well, I think it's about the heart. <laughs> I think it's about what's in the heart of the people. And if you look at some of the Scandinavian countries, they've found a way of making capital as well as making a, a decent civil society. So I think it's about the heart, and I, I think we we in the West, and even, you know, you could look at England right now with the situation we have where the rich get richer and the poor are getting poorer. It's not, just in, it's not just in poor countries that these things happen. In, in the rich countries, it's happening even worse, I think. And it's because of, it's about our greed. It's about, it's about the greed, the lust for money, the lust for power, yeah, the, the lust of, uh, for a sense of ourselves that is uh, predicated on what we have rather than what we, how we be. And I, I don't think capitalism is about to collapse. And I think the main reason is because in our heart, um, we're still too greedy, a lot of us, to, for that to happen. And on that note, hugely interesting topic. We could go on for another hour, but we have no time at all. Ladies and gentlemen, Kerry Young, Naresh Fernandez. Thank you.